little bit about this uh, question and let's talk a little bit about where this question came from. Did this question look familiar to anyone? Yes, it was almost exactly identical to either the homework or one of the pre-lecture quizzes. So let's now dissect this problem and to do that what I'm going to do is first I'm going to reopen this so that way okay I'm going to reopen this and then allow me to, to reshare the page. One moment, let me just get the, the screen sharing back online. Okay, perfect. So let's zoom in on this question and let's talk a little bit about how to solve this. So in this format of the problem, we are given the two isotope masses. So I'm gonna call boron 10 isotope number one. It's perfectly arbitrary, but it's the first one that we see. So that's what I'm gonna label as isotope number one. We know that the mass of isotope one is 10.01 AMU. Okay. Uh, we do not know the percent abundance. So the percent abundance of isotope 1 is a giant question mark. Boron 11 will be isotope number 2. So let's find boron 11. And in this case, we're given that boron 11 has a mass of 10.811 AMU. Okay. We also do not know the percent abundance of isotope 2. But since this is a two isotope system, we know that the percent abundance of our second isotope is equal to 100% minus the percent abundance of isotope one. Yes. Oh, whoops, one moment. Yes, that's correct. Got ahead of myself there. 11.009 AM. The last piece of information that we need in solving this problem is the average atomic mass. And we know that the average atomic mass of boron is 10.811 AMU. I decided to just give you this average atomic mass. Where can we find this number if I did not give it to you? What resource? Periodic table, exactly. So this is readily found in the periodic table. Okay. So with this information established, let's plug in these numbers into our overall equation for average atomic mass. So we have our average atomic mass is equal to the mass of isotope 1, which is 10.01 AMU, times the percentage of isotope 1 divided by 100. The reason why I'm doing this problem from scratch instead of just immediately going to the equation is you could forget the equation, but that doesn't mean you're not able to solve the problem. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So we're gonna plug in now our mass of isotope two, which is 11.009 AMU. And then our percentage is 100%, whoops, one moment, 100%, minus the percentage of isotope one. Let's zoom, oh, oops, one moment. Let's zoom over a little bit. Divided by 100. So we clearly, and let me write this in the correct color so that way we can see, we only really have one unknown. So we're trying to solve for the percent abundance of isotope one, which conveniently is boron 10. So by solving for the percentage of isotope one using this equation, we're essentially solving for the percent abundance of boron 10. You can also solve for the percentage of isotope two and then use this relationship to get the percentage of isotope one. So it really doesn't matter what path you take, you'll reach the same result. So algebraically, we're now solving for this unknown. So let's showcase how we would do that. So first things first, we're gonna move this 100 to the left-hand side. 
So we have 10.811 AMU times 100% is equal to 11.09, oh, 009. And let me switch my pen color for that. 11.009 AMU times 100%. So I'm grouping my terms. So this is the first term that I'm putting in front. And just like as we discussed last class session, we have two terms with a percent of isotope one associated with them, right? Does everyone notice how percent one is associated with this mass term and with this mass term? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna group our like terms together. And so we have the percentage of isotope one times, let me switch colors just so that way everything's consistent, 10.01 AMU minus, and let me go a little bit to the right, 11.009 AMU. So I have essentially grouped these two terms together. Now we're still solving for the percentage of isotope one. So to complete solving for the percentage of isotope one, we're next gonna move this term to the left-hand side, okay? So we have 10.811 AMU minus 11.009 AMU times 100% is equal to 11.009 AMU times 100% is equal to 10.811 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 A
a set of two numbers being subtracted, right? So what do we have to do with these two numbers? If we're going to subtract them, we're going to need to use parentheses. Exactly. So we're going to hit the division symbol and then parentheses. So you should see a zero pop up. We're then going to enter 10.01 minus 11.009. And then we're going to close our parentheses and hit the equal sign. And you should, at the end of this process, get a positive number. Does that make sense? To you? <clears throat> Finally, all we have to do is multiply by 100%, and we get a percent abundance of about 19.82%. So let's write out our full number and then let's round it. So we get 19.819%. Considering and looking at our sig fig here, what is the least number of sig figs present in all of our measurements? Four. four, yep. So this has four sig figs. However, in each of these subtraction operations, and let's just show this in our calculator, if we take 10.01 minus 11.009, we end up with a number with how many decimal places should this number have? We have three, but how many decimal places should this number have if we're following our sig fig rules? So looking at this 10.01, it has how many decimal places? Two. So how many decimal places should our number have? Two. So then, functionally, <coughs> this, if rounded to the right number of sig figs, would be 0 0.99, and this only has two sig figs. So because, as a consequence of the fact that this number on the bottom has two sig figs after subtraction, how many sig figs are we allowed to report in our answer? Two. So you'd report this as 20 dot percent. The sig figs aren't super critical in these sorts of problems due to the fact that atomic masses have an egregiously large number of sig figs and they've been determined to a relatively high level of precision. The reason why I'm highlighting this is just because when you enter series of operations in your calculator, you can often gloss over what is happening in this step? What does the number look like on this subtraction operation? How does that affect my sig figs? So always just be attentive of that. Does that make sense, Deborah? Okay. So if you want to look over this derivation one more time, it's also found in the notes and the recording is at the start of today's lecture. So uh, now that we're all set, let's now continue on with our discussion of chapter two. So, when we last left off, we were talking about the law of multiple proportions, and that is concerned with chemical composition. When we last left off, we were touching on this idea that the law of multiple proportions is really pushing this fact that if two different chemical species have the same ratio of atoms of each element, then they, they're supposedly going to be the same compound. Now, there's one major issue and there's one major type of formula that shows up again and again in chemistry, and it's known as the empirical formula. And what the empirical formula is, quite simply, is the simplest ratio of atoms of each element. Right. So you can end up in a situation where you have two obviously different compounds, right? And why are they different? Do we have the same number of atoms of each element? Just counting our total numbers. Looking at NO2, how many nitrogens do we have? One. How many oxygens? Two. So even though we have a two to one ratio in NO2, we can clearly tell it's different than N2O4, right? Because how many nitrogens does N2O4 have? So we have a different amount of atoms of each element, right? But these two compounds are very hard to differentiate using just classical methods looking at the ratio of elements because the ratio of atoms of each element, the empirical formula, is the same for these compounds. 
There are methods to distinguish these compounds. They have different properties, reactivity. If these atoms have different masses, would you expect these two molecules to weigh a different amount? Just if, if these atoms have mass, would you expect these two molecules to have different masses? Yes. yes. So we can differentiate these compounds, but it's a little more subtle. Okay. In our last example, we looked at a mystery compound X. It has two oxygens and one <coughs> nitrogen. From this information alone, we're not able to tell whether it's NO2 or N2O4. Many, many methods that re re rely on atom mass and the mass of each element inherently will give you what's known as an empirical formula. So, Let's talk a little bit about studies into compounds and the law of multiple proportions, which it really focuses on how do we make new compounds and how do we assign the formula of new compounds. So the law of multiple proportions deals a lot with reaction studies. So we're looking at chemical reactions. So. We know at a baseline, atoms combine to form compounds in whole number ratios. So for example, H2O, we have how many hydrogens? Two. So we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. Oops, let me just set this zoom up so it's a little easier to read. There we go. Now, there's no interpretable way to view half an atom. Atoms will react, react as whole atoms. There's no half atoms here. And we know that the chemical formulas indicate the whole numbers of atoms of each element. So in our H2O example, we saw there are two hydrogens, one oxygen. Now, atoms of two elements can combine in different ratios to give different compounds, right? So depending on the number of atoms of each element, we end up with different compounds. So a different ratio of atoms of each element leads to a different ratio of masses of each element, right? Because, for example, if we look at the hydro hydroxide uh, radical, we have one hydrogen and one oxygen right? Just looking at its formula. Now those atoms have mass, right? This hydrogen, if we go to the periodic table, can we figure out its mass? If we go to the periodic table, can we go and look up the mass of hydrogen? What is the mass of hydrogen about in the periodic table? Yeah, about one. So then, because atoms have mass, our ratio would be one AMU of hydrogen for every one AMU of, oh, for every 16 AMU of oxygen. And if you're curious where we got this 16 from, if we go to the periodic table and look up the mass of oxygen as we did last class session, what's the approximate mass of oxygen? 16. Okay. So we have a clear relationship between our ratio of atoms of each element and our ratio of masses. And we can observe this mass ratio on an, a larger scale. For example, if we look at OH, the hydroxyl radical, we know that we typically have one gram of hydrogen for every 16 grams of oxygen. The small molecular ratio of masses corresponds to a large scale, macro scale ratio of masses. And we can measure masses in grams, right? We can measure out a gram of each chemical species before we, they react, right? So we can measure these macro scale quantities and we can relate our masses to our ratio of elements in our chemical formula. Does that make sense? Okay. So the way this law works, and it requires a very particular and very clever setup. So if two elements react to form two or more different compounds, so if we're forming different compounds, 
what we're going to do is we're going to look at our second element and we're going to compare the masses of our second element and we're going to look at how that second element reacts with a fixed mass of a first element okay so we're going to have a fixed mass of one of our elements in our compound we're going to react it with a variable amount of the second element and by looking at the ratio of masses we can in turn figure out the ratio of atoms of that element now this is easier seen um, so let's showcase an example so in examples a and b these are part of one ex one set of experiments so if we take one gram of carbon in experiment A, and we have one gram of carbon in experiment B. So what is our fixed mass compound? Which, which, uh, what is our fixed mass element? What element are we using the same amount in both experiments? Carbon, okay. And we know in this first experiment, we're taking one gram of carbon, okay. We are reacting it with 1.3 grams of oxygen. Okay. And in turn, we end up with a formula of carbon monoxide. Okay. So, by conservation of mass, all of the carbon and oxygen that were present in our reactants ends up in our product carbon monoxide right so then we have a direct relationship between the mass of carbon used and the number of carbon atoms right so then we know that if we have one gram of carbon in this reaction that corresponds to how many atoms of carbon do we see in our product one so one carbon atom okay just to just to be entirely correct here this is o2 for oxygen that's the pure element form of oxygen Okay, perfect. So let's now look at our second, let's now draw another comparison. So since we know our formula, can we correlate the mass of oxygen with the number of oxygen atoms? Yeah, so then for every 1.3 grams of oxygen, we have how many oxygen atoms? How many oxygen atoms do we see in our product? in carbon monoxide one we are always looking at our product this is where all of our element mass and where all of the atoms found in our pure elements ends up by conservation right okay let's now look at our second experiment in our second experiment what we're doing is we're taking one gram of carbon and this time we are changing the mass of oxygen that reacts if we change the mass of each element that reacts will we change the number of atoms in our product so if we're using more a greater mass of oxygen we have more oxygen atoms reacting Will, those, will we have more oxygen atoms in our product? Yes. So with our 2.6 grams of O2, we end up with a formula of CO2. Now, a critical thing to note, did the mass of carbon change between these experiments? No. Did the mass? No, it did not. Since the mass of carbon did not change between these experiments, we would be able to tell immediately 
that we still have one gram of carbon correlating to one carbon atom. I, didn't, I don't even have to give you the formula for us to figure that out. Let's now look at oxygen in detail. Let's look at oxygen in detail here. We know from our previous experiment, 1.3 grams correlates to one oxygen atom. Okay? So, in other words, we have one oxygen atom per every, let me draw my oxygen a little bit wider, one oxygen atom per every 1.3 grams of oxygen. And how many grams of oxygen did we react in this case? 2.6. The grams cancel, and we're left with, at the end of our calculation, two oxygen atoms. Do you notice how that matches the number of oxygen atoms that end up in our final formula? So in effect, what we've done is we've looked at the ratio of mass to number of atoms in our first experiment. We know that because we're given the mass of oxygen and our formula. We can then look at a new reaction where we have a fixed amount of one element and we've changed the mass of our second. Because we know that for every 1.3 grams of oxygen that we react, we have one oxygen atom in our formula. If we have twice the amount of oxygen that reacts, we would expect twice the amount of oxygen atoms in our formula. Does that make sense? This is the empirical method for how formulas of many new compounds were determined. We would mix variable amounts of two elements together, and we would make new compounds, and by comparison, we can identify their formula. Okay, so let's, let's do some more examples. So, this is a classic way that these problems are phrased. So, we have a, where we made a 30 gram sample of nitrogen monoxide. We did this by reacting 14 grams of nitrogen, which should technically be N2, with 16 grams of oxygen. Okay, so let's write out our first, our first scheme here. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. In this first case, we have 14 grams of nitrogen, and we've reacted it with 16 grams of oxygen. By conservation, we ended up with a, with a total of 30 grams of nitrogen monoxide. Okay, so that's our first experiment. In our second experiment, we generate 44 grams of an unknown compound by reacting 28 grams of nitrogen and 16 grams of oxygen. So what is our fixed mass species? Oxygen. So oxygen has a fixed mass, okay? Okay, so let's write down everything that we know. So we wrote down the mass of each of our component elements, and our goal in this problem is to figure out the formula of our unknown compound. And we already have a freebie here, right? Since if the mass of oxygen correlates to the number of oxygen atoms, and the mass of oxygen is fixed, and that mass correlates to one oxygen atom, how many oxygen atoms do we have in this unknown compound at our first guess? One. Okay, so let's write that out. So by comparison, we would expect for there to be one oxygen atom. Good. For nitrogen, we're going to have to get a little bit clever. We're going to have to get a little bit clever. 
So first and foremost, we know from this first example that we have one nitrogen atom per how many grams of nitrogen? What is our atom to mass ratio? So we have one nitrogen atom when how many grams of nitrogen react? 14. 14. So all we're going to do is we're going to say we have one nitrogen atom for every 14 grams of nitrogen that react. Perfect. Now, to figure out the number of nitrogen atoms in our unknown compound, we're going to look and see how much nitrogen reacted to make our unknown compound. 28, okay. So we're gonna multiply by 28 grams of nitrogen. And that tells us we have two nitrogen atoms in our product. This is quite intuitive, actually. We doubled the mass of nitrogen. So what would happen to our atoms? They double, right? I find a lot, of, I, a lot of these problems, if you just think about it intuitively, what's happening to our masses, you can quickly see what's happening to your ratio of atoms. Any questions on this example? So from these two experiments, we are able to deduce this compound had a formula of N2O. Is everyone comfortable solving a problem like this on their own? Okay, so I'll let you loose on one of these problems now. So, acetylene, let me zoom in, contains 24 grams of carbon and 2 grams of hydrogen. Ethylene contains 24 grams of carbon and 4 grams of hydrogen. And I'd like you to tell me, given the following picture for acetylene, how many hydrogen atoms are found in ethylene? So what's the formula of ethylene? So I'll give you a few minutes to work on that. And don't be shy to talk in groups while you're working on these problems. Any questions? And the best way to start is to just write down all the information you have in the lessons and the Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Oh, yep. Yep. That looks right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, looks good. Oh, uh, it's just. What's that two F? Oh, oh, that's an A. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no problem. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? So, you have two experiments. So, write down the masses used in each experiment mm -hmm. and then write down their known formula. Oh. And then from that, you're going to compare the masses to see how do the number of atoms in the formula change. Oh, okay. Appreciate it. Any questions? Okay. Yep, exactly right. Any questions? We'll start by writing out the atoms of each one and then note the masses and see what changes in terms of mass. Yeah, looks good. So let's discuss this problem <coughs> as we'll be doing more practice on this. So acetylene contains 24 grams of carbon and 2 grams of hydrogen. Okay, so acetylene. So we know if I take 24 grams of carbon 
and react it with two grams of hydrogen, you will end up with a chemical formula for acetylene of C2H2, right? Did I give you the, the formula for acetylene in picture form? How many carbons do we see? How many hydrogens? Two. Okay. So we know that ethylene contains four grams of hydrogen and it also contains 24 grams of carbon. Okay. So what is our fixed mass element? Carbon. So this mass is fixed. So then, do we have the same number of atoms? Yes. Yes. So how many atoms of carbon are found in ethylene? Two. Two. Okay. And now this one, we're just going to look at it visually here. We went from two grams of hydrogen to four. So what happened to our amount of hydrogen? It doubled. It doubled. So what's going to happen to our amount of hydrogen atoms double. double exactly so this two times two is four just to show this in the long hand method we have two hydrogen atoms for every two grams of hydrogen in the second example we have four grams of hydrogen so two times two gives us four hydrogen atoms so we conclude that the formula of ethylene is C2H4. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Let's do a few more examples on this. Anyone still have questions on this? Don't be shy to ask. This is actually a scaffolding for when we start to deal with what's known as stoichiometry. This is the precursor to chemical composition calculations. So let's now talk a little bit about Dalton's atomic model. So now we're going to take a broader overview and summarize everything that we've discussed in this chapter. So we've established elements are composed of indivisible particles called atoms. We know that atoms of the same element have the same mass and size. Um, why do I have an asterisk there? I have an asterisk there. What's one exception to this? Atoms of the same element with different mass? We, isotopes, yeah. So that asterisk is just saying isotopes exist. Dalton's model doesn't quite account for them. So in this model, for example, if we look at a hydrogen atom, it has a mass equal to 1 AMU. And we know that it has one proton to its name. If we see another mystery element, which, which has an atomic mass of one AMU, and we figure out experimentally that its atomic size indicates that there are roughly one proton found in that element, what is this mystery species going to be? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, exactly. Atoms of the same element are alike in mass and size. As a corollary to this, atoms of different elements have different masses, sizes, and properties. So if we look at hydrogen with its mass of 1 AMU, and we compare it to, for example, oxygen with a mass of 16 AMU, we can clearly tell the difference between these two elements, not only based on their masses, but based on their atomic size and also their reactivity. Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas have dramatically different properties in chemical reactions. Hydrogen gas, if you try to light a match near it, will blow the room up. Oxygen gas will, will oxidize metals at high temperatures. Different properties and reactivity for different elements. Now, we can make 
more complicated substances such as compounds by combining, let me switch colors for this, two or more atoms of different elements. Okay, so compounds are made from two or more different elements. <clears throat> and atoms will combine to form compounds in whole number ratios. For example, CH4, CH4. Let me rewrite that. So for CH4, we have how many carbons? One. So we have one carbon and how many hydrogen? Four. Notice how these are whole numbers, no fractions. Half an atom doesn't make any sense from a physical perspective. And as we've just seen with the law of multiple proportions, Atoms of two elements can combine in different ratios to give different compounds. For example, C2H2 is known as acetylene. Any welders in the room? No? Okay. Well, uh, acetylene, when burned, produces a large amount of energy. Acetylene tanks are quite alarming to watch people handle because acetylene can form explosive mixtures with air. If we compare that to CH4, which is methane, as you see, we have a different ratio of elements, and so we have different properties. Uh, we're in a relatively agricultural area, Methane is a primary emission from cows, as well as a primary, I wouldn't call byproduct, but unwanted gas often generated and collected during fracking. So dramatically different formulas, different properties and reactivity. And then finally, atoms cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. Atoms are only rearranged. This is the cornerstone of the idea of conservation of mass. For example, if I take 12 grams of carbon and I combine it together with 4 grams of hydrogen, I will generate CH4. Whoops, one moment. And how many grams of methane will I make by conservation? 16. 12 plus 4 gives us 16 grams of methane. Let me just rewrite this over here. There we go. Any questions on that? Yes. Ah, so the mass, so the, the better way of writing this would be plus 2H2. So the, the ratio of masses doesn't tell us anything about, it doesn't tell us the number of molecules at, at immediate site. If we know the formula of H2, then we can correlate this mass with the number of atoms and the number of molecules. We don't actually need to know the chemical equation in order for us to draw this conclusion. And that's the beauty of conservation of mass. Because atoms are not created or destroyed, we can deal with chemical reactions just looking at masses. What these masses also allow us to do is they allow us to relate the mass of each element that reacts and the number of atoms of each element in our formula. But we're not at the point yet where we're able to truly say, this is what's occurring in our chemical reaction. This is the exact chemical equation. But we're getting there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's now conclude this chapter by discussing chemical formulas and reading through chemical formulas so what does a chemical formula allow us to do what is the purpose of a chemical formula so let's zoom in on that so chemical formulas specify the number of atoms of each element in a molecule or a compound The subscript 
which is the number in lower case subscript indicates the number of atoms of that element. So when we see, for example, H2, how many hydrogen atoms do we have? Two. Okay. Now, subscripts can also be used for a bit more of a fancy purpose. They can also indicate the number of polyatomic subunits or ions. So if you see a set of atoms in parentheses with a subscript, for example, OH subscript two, what that is saying is we have two OH units. So this two applies to both atoms in parentheses. So for example, that would say we have two hydroxides, and if we count up our total number of atoms, how many oxygen atoms do we have? Two. Yep. And how many hydrogen atoms do we have? Two. Just by just by inspection, right? How many H's do you see? Two. Yeah. So just be careful when you're dealing with subscripts for polyatomic ions that you're counting your atoms correctly. This is the most common mistake I see when we start analyzing chemical formulas and we start balancing <coughs> chemical reactions. So uh, let's do some practice. Let's indicate the atoms of each element. So calcium chloride, I'll start that off. That's an easy one. We have one calcium and we have two chlorine atoms. We're not going to make the distinction yet between atoms and ions yet. Let's do another example, calcium nitrate. How many calciums do we see? One. Okay. Now, we have this NO32. So remember, what does that subscript mean? It's applying to both. Yes. So how many nitrogens do we have? Two. Two. And how many oxygens do we have? Six. Okay. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you loose and you're going to dissect these next four chemical formulas. You want to get really good at counting atoms of each element because it's going to be critical when we start to assess mass ratios, mole ratios, and we start looking at chemical composition. It's also important when we start to name these compounds, which we'll be doing in the later half of the day. these examples. So would someone like to volunteer for this first one? Aluminum, hydro aluminum hydroxide. Yep. 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 Perfect. Yes. Wonderful. So we have one aluminum, three oxygens, and three hydrogens. Would someone else like to volunteer a response for this second example? Sodium carbonate? Yes. Yep. 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 Perfect. Exactly right. 
Let's now do a tricky one. Would someone like to volunteer their response for ammonium sulfate? Uh, yes. Yep. <laughs> Four oxygen. Four oxygen. Uh, I, I heard you mention one sulfate. Yeah. So in case, in, for, for those who are curious, this SO4 is called sulfate. So um, yeah, but that's perfectly correct. Let's look at this last one now, magnesium phosphate. Would someone like to volunteer? Yes. Uh, yep. 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 Perfect. And although this seems like a relatively silly exercise, we're just, we're just counting symbols, right? This is the backbone to how we balance chemical equations, to how we write out formulas from names, and how we assess the masses of each element in a compound. So counting elements is critical. So what we're now going to do is we are going to switch to the next chapter, which is chapter three. And the focus of chapter three, which is called Molecules, Compounds, and Chemical Equations, this has been posted on, on Canvas and was there for at least two weeks. Um, let's now discuss chapter three and let's talk about our goals for this chapter. Let's talk about our goals for this chapter. So, here is what I want from you in this chapter. I always like to highlight what I'm going to be testing on in these chapters. So we want to be able to predict the charge of ions. So we're going to want to predict charge. OK. We want to identify and name compounds. These are all just different types of compounds. I want you to be able to write formulas given the name. and. This is starting to bleed into the next chapter, but mass and mole calculations and empirical formula calculations. So what we're gonna do in this class session is we're gonna introduce you to different types of compounds. We're gonna talk how to calculate charge of ions. And then most importantly, how do we name compounds? How do we communicate chemical formulas efficiently? Everyone clear what we're doing in this chapter? So keep your eye out for these types of concepts, as these are what I'm going to test on. OK, so first and foremost, let's take a look at the periodic table. So the periodic table is divided into three major regions that we care about in this section. So this is what we care about for this chapter, for the purposes of naming compounds. First and foremost, we have our metals. They are in orange. What side of the periodic table are our metals found? Left, and are they high up or are they far down in the periodic table? Far down. So for metals, I like to draw an arrow going down and to the left. Now, the other major division, and yes, I am intentionally skipping the metalloids for now, are our non-metals. And what region of the periodic table are our non-metals? To the right, okay. And are they high up or low in the periodic table? High up. Yep, so they're primarily upper right corner. Don't forget that hydrogen is a non-metal. Hydrogen does not behave similar to most metals, thankfully. We're now going to talk about an intermediate group that has properties in between that of a metal and a non-metal. These are primarily found in semiconductors, such as those found in your cell phone, and these are the metalloids. The metalloids occupy this dividing line separating our metals and our non-metals. And what's really wonderful is most periodic tables Let's look at the one that you'll see on exams. Most periodic tables do not actually delineate what species are metals, nonmetals, or metalloids. The way that I like to remember and the way that I like to separate my metals and my nonmetals is I like to think of boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, and atnium. 
if you draw this diagonal line, that cleanly separates your metals and your nonmetals. And that's easier to memorize than memorizing nine elements, right? If you just memorize where the diagonal is located, you can quickly say, oh, this is a metal. Oh, this is a nonmetal. Metalloids, the primary metalloids that are that we'll talk about in this class are boron, silicon, arsenic. The other metalloids aren't as prolific in compounds that you'll see in this class. I don't want you to memorize every single element and whether it's a metal or a non-metal or a metalloid. I want you to know generally what portion of the periodic table are our metals? What region are our non-metals? Yes. Which, which one? Um, AT. AT. Uh, that one's a little bit subjective, depending on the, the exact version of the periodic table. Though that compound, where, oh, that element in compounds we don't typically see because that's not a very stable element. Once you get really far down the periodic table, you start getting to radioactive, very rare elements. So they don't come up often in chemical discourse. Yeah. So how, why, why, am I, why am I showing you these divisions? Well, elements, as we discussed all the way in chapter one, can be either atomic or molecular. Now, the beauty of these divisions in the periodic table is our atomic elements are two major groups or two major types of elements are metals and a special category called the noble gases. The noble gases are all elements in group 8A or column 8A. Let's show in the periodic table where our noble gases are. So does everyone see this 8A? Yeah, so that's our group number. And this entire column are our noble gases. It's quite an important column to remember as they often help us understand the charges of ions and they help us understand what are known as electron configurations of ions that we'll discuss later on in this class. Noble gases are relatively stable and they have very unique properties. So our atomic elements are primarily our metals and our noble gases. So for example, you would see formulas for neon, which is a noble gas, of just neon one atom, right? Does everyone see how neon is an atomic element? Because how many, how many atoms do we see? One, exactly. Likewise, if I said, and let's pick a really obscure metal just to, to bring home this point. Uh, if I said cesium, CS, what would the formula of cesium be? How many atoms should I write for the element cesium? One, exactly. It would just be cesium solid. Again, it's an atomic element. Metals are overwhelmingly atomic elements. Now, let's talk about our molecular elements as they get a little bit more interesting. So the molecular elements are primarily our non-metals. Non-metals in general like to form covalent bonds and generate um, higher order molecular elements. So your diatomic, implies two atoms. So these are our halogens, oxygen, and nitrogen. So our halogens, oh, whoops, one moment. So our halogens are another named group in the periodic table. This is group 7A. So let's find the halogens. So if we go up in the periodic table, does everyone, one moment, give it a moment. Okay, does everyone see the column titled 7A? Yeah. So this column or this group corresponds to our halogens. 
And these are quite dangerous compounds to work with due to their high reactivity. These are many of the infamous poisons used throughout history. So an example of an infamous halogen as a diatomic element, let's look at chlorine. So what would a proper formula for chlorine be? Cl2. Key thing, it's diatomic. We'll talk about why I label it as a gas later on in this class. So key thing, what we're starting to do is correlate element name, right? I said chlorine. And you are able to, using these rules, say that means Cl2. So we're starting to name elements and write the formulas of elements. Does that make sense? Now, let's look at another example. So oxygen is O2 gas. This is oxygen. Nitrogen is N2 gas. And the other diatomic element that I want you to know is it's commonly produced in chemical reactions is H2 gas, which is our good old friend hydrogen. Any questions? So what I'm going to have you be responsible for is you're going to be responsible for given the name, writing the proper symbol and formula for any element that I want. Does that make sense? So you should know the correlation between the name and the symbol, as well as the formula. <clears throat> Thankfully, there are only a few common polyatomic elements. So our polyatomic elements have three or more atoms. And the only ones that you'll see really in this class are sulfur, which is S8 solid. It's a bright yellow solid. We'll be working with it actually in one of the later labs in this class. And phosphorus, which is P4. Which is somewhat of a hard commodity to get due to the, the fact that it's highly regulated. Any questions between the names and formulas of common elements in our periodic table? Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about how the periodic table is organized. So the periodic table is organized into columns known as groups. And groups of elements have similar reactivity and properties. So we're grouping elements based on their reactivity and properties. So we call main group elements, they, they are groups 1A through 8A. I like to think of main group elements as A group elements. Your transition metals are the elements with group numbers 1B through 8B. And the transition metals are primarily in the middle of the periodic table. Now, when we think about the periodic table, looking at the atomic numbers, as we move to the right in the periodic table, What's happening as we move across the periodic table? What's happening to our atomic numbers? Are they going up or down? Up, increasing. So each row, so a row horizontally is known as a period. And each row or period is arranged in order of increasing number of protons, increasing atomic numbers. This was earlier observed by looking at increases in atomic mass, right? So you can even start to organize elements very similarly to the modern periodic table just by looking at their reactivity and looking at their mass. The modern periodic table is organized via atomic number, number of protons. Okay, and again, this is really critical. Elements with similar properties fall into the same group or column. We're now gonna talk about a few of the named groups. 
And these are ones that are important to remember because we're gonna be talking about them in terms of how they react. So, first, I always just wanna point out the super group or block in the periodic table known as the transition metals. So the transition metals are our B group elements. They occupy a pretty large chunk of the middle of the periodic table. Transition metals are also named quote unquote D block elements for a reason that we'll get into towards the end of this class. Now, the first named group that we should think about is the 1A. Group 1A corresponds to the alkali metals. These are highly reactive metals uh, that are really good at donating electrons. These react violently with water. And um, as you notice, hydrogen is part of that group, but I would consider it very different in terms of properties and reactivity. Would someone like to suggest why is hydrogen a little bit different than these other alkali metals? Yes. Well, yes, if, if you put hydrogen in water, you don't see a violent fireball. That's correct. But also, what's the difference between hydrogen and these other elements? Yeah, hydrogen, well, it's a gas. That's one difference. But the main thing is hydrogen is a non-metal. So it's not really, it's part of the same group, but it doesn't react like an alkali metal because it's not a metal. Okay. The other group that is a relative of the alkali metals are our alkaline earth metals. The reason why they're called alkaline earth metals is because when mixed with water, they produce a violent reaction and the solution becomes alkaline or basic. The name actually is quite informative on how these compounds react. And we'll see this actually in the chapter on chemical reactions. So if I say I'd like you to tell, like you to write the symbol of an alkaline earth metal with atomic number 20, you'd go group 2A, oh, I found calcium. So I want you to start thinking about elements in terms of their group name and group number. The other major named group that comes up a lot when we discuss chemical reactions are halogens, which are the 7A elements. Halogens are highly reactive. They're diatomic, so they're of the form X2. And they're generally a little bit dangerous to work with due to their vicious reactivity. Contrasting that with the next group that we're going to discuss are noble gases, the 8A elements. Noble gases are atomic species, as their name implies. Are they primarily solids, liquids, or gases? The noble gases. Gases. See, the group number is descriptive. And the main feature of the noble gases is they have relatively low reactivity. Whoops, one moment. Let me move this over. The noble gases are known for their characteristic low reactivity. And we'll be referencing the noble gases a lot when we discuss stable ions and when we talk about ion charge. Okay, let's now keep going here. I just wanted always for you to know, here is the periodic table that you'll be receiving on the exam. If there is nothing explicitly noted in this periodic table, you will not be provided it on the exam. So get used to using this periodic table in solving problems. So that way, when you get to the exam, you don't look at the periodic table and go, it looks different than the one I've been using. And with that, uh, we're done for today, and I'll see you in lab in a few minutes.